Huh. Watching Kyle's unboxing videos again? Yeah, he always finds the coolest... No way! A robot dog? Gotta ask where he got it. Or use your Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Just draw a circle around the dog on your screen, and it shows you where to buy it right in the app. Oh, I just learned a new trick. And that for once, I beat Kyle to the next big thing. Circle it, find it, with the new Galaxy S24 Ultra, and circle the search with Google. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Internet connection required. Results may vary based on visuals. You've got to shake it up to break it up. And what is it we're breaking up? We're breaking up old habits and old patterns. Something dramatic has to happen. What you do is you replace one behavior with a new behavior that's incompatible with the old one. You must recognize and use the ego and greed of others to create a path to success. Now, (laughs) again, you're probably saying, oh, wait a minute. What are you saying here? I'm Katie Maloney, 37, a divorcee, and I'm out here falling in love every day with myself. And I'm Dana Kathan, 33, former needy mess and delusional Leo, but I've never been happier. Never been happier. You know that. Good. (laughs) The foundation of this podcast is for people who want to live their life unapologetically. It's a safe space for anyone who's going through a transition in their life or just dealing with the regular bullshit. It's a religion. We're not saying that we're looking to start a coven, but that might be why we started this podcast. Stop saying that. Join our cult. I mean, community. I mean, the coven. Religion. Let's just stick with community. Listen to the podcast. Listen to the podcast. (laughs) Hey, it's Dr. Phil, and we are back talking about Living by Design 9. I've been getting a lot of comments from you guys, and I want to take a few minutes before we pick up with our next item in the playbook. I really appreciate your feedback. A lot of you have said, I can't believe you're giving us all of this information. We keep waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like, are we going to get a bill for this at the end or something? I can't believe I'm getting this for free in a podcast, but you are. There's no other shoe to drop. I do want something from you, though. And what I want from you is to stop for a minute and ask yourself what you're doing with what we've talked about so far. And it means something different for everybody. All of you hear something different from what I say. All of you apply it differently in your life. Some of you are plumbers. Some of you are teachers. Some of you are bureaucrats. Some of you are politicians or bankers or executives, whatever. I know because you write to me. And it doesn't matter what it is that you're doing in your life. It's important that whatever it is you're doing, that you have made the decision that you're going to star in your own life. Now, I've talked about that so far, and I've had some people that have actually, I've seen around, that have asked me about that. This weekend, I was at Tyler Perry's grand opening of his beautiful new studio complex in Atlanta, and several people came up to me there and told me how much they were enjoying this series and they said starring in your own life is not as easily done as it is said i understand that if this was easy everybody would do it i want to talk to you about this concept that i call shake it up to break it up and i'm going to start with that in 40 seconds I said I wanted to talk to you about a concept that I call shake it up to break it up. I've given you already 10 parts of a playbook that I want you to follow. I've said that you must have a defined image and never, ever go out of character. Now, that's a big deal. We talked about it in great detail. I said you must create a perception of uniqueness. If you want people to keep you around, I said you must play big and not long. There's a big difference between the two. I've said that you have to learn to claim and accept praise and acknowledge it in a gracious way, but do accept it. It's not egotistical to accept it. I said you must become essential. You've got to create a way that whether it's in your relationship, your business, your family, you've got to find a way to become essential. 
you have to know what your real currency is so you don't wind up spending your life working for what you don't want. I said you must always, always have a plan. Don't ever be an unguided missile. Always have a plan. I've said that you must keep things close to the vest. Don't tell everybody your plan because that plan is what's going to get you where you need to go and get what you want. I've said you must always be in investigatory mode. You must always be figuring out what you need to know that gives you an edge. And before I get to the next item, when I say you've got to change, think about momentum. If you want to really change the way you're living your life, Something dramatic has to happen because if you think just all of a sudden you're going to listen to me for a few weeks and just automatically your life's going to change, it will not. You are going to consciously have to change how you live day to day, week to week, month to month. Now, think about a bowling alley. Let's say we're throwing a ball down a bowling alley and we want that ball to make a right turn. 90 degree turn. What's it going to have to hit? It's going to have to hit a big brown block of concrete to stop its momentum and redirect it in another way. What is that in your life? What do you need to do where, as I've said before, people need to look at you and say, what happened to her? What happened to him? They seem different. And let me tell you just how concrete I mean that. When I say shake it up to break it up, I mean be as concrete as go home and rearrange all the furniture in your house. Get a new haircut. Change your hair color. Change the way you go to work. Change something. Change everything where it feels fresh. People always joke about, oh, it's that new car smell. You get a new car and it's exciting, right? Because it's fresh. It's new. Well, how do you make your life fresh and new? You do it by changing things. People avoid change, but you've got to run to change. You've got to embrace change. You've got to create change. And I really mean it just that simply. Go home and rearrange all the furniture in your living room. Go home and take the bed off one wall, put it on another wall. If you always go home and change and then go to the gym, Go to the gym in the mornings instead of the afternoons. Change something that signals a new day. Change something in your life. If you've got long hair, chop it off. If you've got short hair, grow it out. If you're a brunette, become a blonde. I mean, do something that's different that signals, demarcates a passage. says it was on that day, that week, that weekend that everything changed. You've got to shake it up to break it up. And what is it? We're breaking up old habits and old patterns. You don't break habits. What you do is you replace one behavior with a new behavior that's incompatible with the old one. You know, people say, oh, I've got this smoking habit. Well, that habit is a coping mechanism. You use it to handle stress or anxiety or keep from eating or whatever, how whatever you started it. Maybe you started to look cool or I don't know, but it served a purpose. We don't do anything in our lives that don't pay us off in some way. So if you're going to stop doing something, you have to figure out what was the payoff for it. And if you're going to eliminate it, you have to figure out if that was a positive payoff, you need to figure out how you're going to get that payoff without doing what you were doing. So if you were getting pleasure from eating too much or pleasure from smoking, or you were getting some kind of validation or confirmation from playing the nice guy, then you need to figure out, okay, if I'm going to get rid of this habit of playing the nice guy by telling people what they want to hear, and I got a lot of pats on the back for that, and that was currency to me, and I'm going to stop doing that, I'm going to miss those pats on the back. I'm going to miss that feeling of acceptance. So what am I going to do to get that a different way? Because if you don't replace that behavior with something that gives you the same or better payoff, 
guess what happens? It's going to come creeping right back in based on something called instinctual drift. We have this tendency to regress to the norm. We pull ourselves out to the side and do something different for a while, but across time we're going to drift back to what was our norm unless we find a new way to get the same kind of payoff if it was a healthy payoff. Okay, so think about that. You've got to shake it up to break it up. Change something in your life. Change everything in your life. Well, not everything. You don't need to change your spouse. You can't change your kids. You don't even need to quit your job and go to a new one. You just need to change how you do it and change your environment, your world. Change the way you walk. Change the way you sit in a chair. Change everything you can that signals a new day. And let's start right now. How are you sitting right this minute? Are you kind of slouching? Sit up. Sit up right now. Serious, I'm not kidding you. Sit up right now. Sit up really tall. Pull your shoulders back. Put your head up. Sit up tall. Sit up with some pride. How do you present yourself? It begins with that. How do you present yourself? Begin with that. Just that subtle little change. Remember the example I gave between walking in the park and feeding the pigeons versus walking from A to B with a purpose? Change the way you walk. If you take the elevator to your office in the morning, start taking the stairs. If you take the stairs, take a different set of stairs. Do something different. I'm trying to get you out of the rut. I don't want to give you these things I've listed so far, and these just be some kind of mental masturbation, something you just go through with an intellectual exercise, but there's no behavioral correlate that goes along with it. You've got to change your behavior. If you want a different result, you've got to make different choices and do different behaviors. Okay, I hope... I've gotten your attention to the need to actually change what you do. Because seriously, this is not an intellectual exercise. For example, there's a big difference between thinking something and writing it down. When you write something down, you get some distance from it. You get some objectivity from it. So if you go to the website and you see a list there, it's not enough to just read through it and answer it in your head. That's lazy. Winners do things losers don't want to do. Get out your laptop, print out the page, write it out, do something. But if you don't actually emit a behavior, it's not going to have the same impact. So I'm really encouraging you to change something. I don't want you to just go through this, listen to it, and go, yeah, that was really entertaining. I'm not here to entertain you. I'm here to change the way you're living your life. All right. I said there were 16 things in the playbook. Number 14, you must deal only with the truth. You must deal only with the truth. Denial, trivializing things, minimizing things, that's for suckers. You have to deal with the truth. I don't care what it is that you're dealing with, whether it's parenting your kids, dealing with a crisis in your marriage, dealing with a crisis in your health, you have to deal with the truth. Winners deal with the truth. And you know when they deal with it, they deal with it at the first opportunity they have. They deal with the truth as soon as it presents itself. Now, That seems self-evident, right? Telling you that if you want to be a winner, one of your items in the playbook is you deal with the truth. You don't lie to yourself. But that's not as intuitively obvious as it may seem because we tend, through something called perceptual defense, to screen out things we don't want to see, we don't want to hear, and give our brain access to only those things that don't upset us. And you have to consciously overcome that. Now, let me talk about what I mean by that. And I guess it boils down to this. 
when you think about it, don't you know the truth when you hear it? Let's say you are really worrying about something. You're really worrying about a test result from a doctor. You're really worrying about your kids out on an icy road or something, and it's, you're really worrying about it. And your friends are there, and they're coming by and patting you on the back of the hand saying, oh, it's going to be fine. Oh, it's going to be okay. Now, everything's going to be fine. Does that really make you feel better? Because it doesn't me. It's never made me feel better. What makes me feel better is somebody that comes by and says, okay, let's think this through. Let's assume that it is not good news. What's our next step? If it comes back positive, what does that mean? What do you do? Monsters live in the dark. Let's turn the lights on and see what we have to deal with here. What are the chances? What are you actually facing here? What are you dealing with? That's the person I want to talk to. Some vapid imbecile that comes by and pats me on the back of the hand and tells me it's going to be okay, unless they're a soothsayer, that doesn't give me any comfort whatsoever. It's going to be okay. Really? How do you know that? What is it that you know that I don't know? Look, they're just trying to be supportive, right? I hate to be harsh with them, but frankly, shut up. You don't know anything about it, so why are you talking to me about it? I want to talk to somebody that has talked to the highway patrol or has some way to get some information or understands what the diagnosis would mean or what has some relevant information grounded in reality and based on fact instead of they want to make themselves feel better because they came over and patted me on the hand and told me it was going to be okay. Deal with the truth. As I have studied case after case after case of champions, case after case of people that are winners, whether it's in business, research, athletics, or whatever, I never found people that stayed in bad relationships. Interestingly enough, they didn't have an unusually high divorce rate, but they didn't stay in bad relationships. You know what they did? They said, this sucks. I don't like this. It's painful. It drains me of my energy. So I'm either going to fix it or move on. But they would say, okay, we're not going to do this anymore. And I always tell people that if you don't believe in divorce, okay, then look at your partner and say, we're not getting a divorce and we're not living like this anymore either. Neither of those two are options. So what's the third option? We're going to change. We're going to fix this. But the people that I've studied as champions, by and large, do not stay in relationships that are toxic, sick, draining, pulling them down. And they admit it the minute they see it. Maybe it's them. Maybe it's their partner. Maybe it's just the way they come together. But they admit it. Because the only thing worse than being in a bad relationship for 10 years is being in a bad relationship for 10 years and one day. The sooner you know it, the faster you can deal with it. So deal with the truth. If you're in a business and it's bleeding cash, don't kid yourself. Tell yourself, we're bleeding cash here. Deal with the truth. When you open your kid's sock drawer and you push all the socks to the side so you can put some more socks in the sock drawer and there's a baggie of marijuana laying there and you're standing at the door tapping your foot when the kid comes home and he says, okay, no big deal. That's not mine. I took that from Billy because I didn't want him to get caught with it. And I've told him, we're just not going to have that. Don't be an idiot. It's in his sock drawer. It's his drugs. People don't give friends their drugs to hang on to. Deal with the truth. You find drugs in your kid's drawer, it's your kid's drugs. I'm sorry. And if it's not his drugs and he gets burned for it, then he learns a good lesson. It's idiotic to be holding drugs for your friends. 
but don't lie to yourself because you want it not to be your kids' drugs. And if you know your kids on drugs and they're telling you, okay, mom, I've quit that. I'm not going to do it anymore. And you go find drug paraphernalia in their room or their car, or they're staying up all night. They're showing drug behavior. Don't lie to yourself. Deal with the truth. And people always say, you know, Dr. Phil, one of the things I deal with is, I don't know, I've just got a really poor self-image. I've got really low self-esteem, and I've got a really poor self-image. You would think that a psychologist would say, well, come on, you got to believe in yourself. Get a positive dialogue going. That is not the first thing I say. The first thing I say is, well, let's look at the truth. Is your poor self-image, is your low self-esteem realistic? Seriously, if you haven't worked in two years and you're abusive with your wife and you're abusing drugs and alcohol, you should have a bad self-image. You should have low self-esteem. Let's deal with the truth. I don't want to go puff this guy up when, in fact, he has a pretty clear view of himself. What I would rather do is acknowledge that he has a clear view of himself and that his poor self-image is accurate. And so putting on his to-do list is to change who he is and how he behaves rather than changing the dialogue about how he's labeling who he is and how he behaves. Old sayings get to be old sayings because they are profound. They stick around generation to generation to generation because they fit. And an old saying is you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. That stick around generation to generation because it's true. You can take somebody that is an unemployed, wife-abusing drug addict and get him to say positive things to himself. That's like putting lipstick on a pig. You're not dealing with the truth. He needs to be honest about that. So he can put on his to-do list improving his values, improving his behavior, improving his motivation, improving his goals in life, rather than just changing his internal dialogue. When we're talking about medicine, we always say that early intervention, early detection, early intervention is often the key to a good outcome. They say that because it's true. You catch something before it gets a good foothold, you can oftentimes knock it out. But if you wait until it overcomes all of your body's resistance, it compromises your constitution, it's an infection that spreads throughout your whole body, something that could have been easily handled now becomes monumental or even insurmountable. Why? Because you didn't deal with the truth. You didn't admit you had a problem. You didn't want to go to the doctor because you were afraid what he or she might tell you. You didn't want to hear the truth. So you stuck your head in the sand, and it got worse and worse and worse until you couldn't deny it. And now what could have been easily eliminated becomes a serious problem. You must deal only with the truth, and the sooner you do, the better off you're going to be. That's number 14 in the playbook for success. Number 15, you must recognize and use the ego and greed of others to create a path to success. Yeah, you heard me right. You must recognize and use the ego and greed of others to create a path to success. Now you're thinking, all right, Dr. Phil, you're starting to play hardball now. I am so serious. You've got to understand the psychology of human nature. If you want to get people to do what you want people to do, you have to understand what makes people tick. I've said 
a thousand times that from the time I was 12 years old, I have been fascinated by why people do what they do and don't do what they don't do. Now think about that for a second. The world is interactive. The world is a game. The world is a competition. This is not communism here. This is capitalism. Somebody's going to win. Somebody's going to lose. Somebody's going to have the top spot in the hierarchy. Somebody's going to be at the bottom. Somebody's going to be the most popular. Somebody's going to be the least popular. Somebody's going to have the highest paying job. Somebody's going to have the lowest paying job. We live in a meritocracy. That means we advance based on merit. We advance based on what we can get done. And if you have the ability to get people to do what you want them to do when you want them to do it, is there any way you cannot be successful? And I think the answer to that is no. People that can motivate others, people that can move others, people that can rally others are going to be successful. If you're a salesman, I don't care if you're selling computers or software or cars or houses or insurance, whatever. If you understand why people do what they do and don't do what they don't do, you are going to have a huge edge, a huge advantage over everyone else. If you understand that about yourself, how many diets have you been on? How many diets have you quit? I talked to a guy the other day that told me he had lost 480 pounds. I said, really? He said, yep. I've lost the same 20 pounds over and over and over again. I asked him if he knew why. Why do you start and then stop? He said, I don't have a clue. I get bored, I guess. So I wrote a book about diets and I got into a huge survey about why people fail with diets and why they don't. And it was really interesting. One of the big items was they get bored. They eat the same stuff. They start craving other stuff and they rebel. They get bored and they rebel. They get bored, they rebel. They get bored, they rebel. So if you're ever going to have a diet that's successful, you've got to get around boredom so you don't get rebellion. What makes you tick? Why do you do what you do? Why do you work? Is it for money? Is it for recognition? Why do you coach your kids? Why do you go to parties? Why do you do anything that you do? If you don't know why you do what you do, you need to find out. Why do you not do what you don't do? You need to find out. You know, I mentioned that I was at a social event this weekend. Let me tell you something about myself. You're probably going to think I'm lying to you here, but I'm not. I'm very shy. Seriously, I'm very shy. I understand I'm on television every day. I understand I talk to like 35, 40 million people a week. I understand that. And I bet you think I don't look nervous up there at all. And you know what? I'm not. I'm not the least bit nervous. Why? Because I'm task-oriented. You give me something to do in a crowd it doesn't make any difference to me if the crowd is 10 million or 100 million. It makes no difference to me whatsoever as long as I have something to do. You put me at a cocktail party with 50 people, 100 people. It was last weekend, 400, 500 people. It's my personal hell. I would rather get a root canal from a bad dentist then go to a cocktail party and make small talk. 
It's just not my thing. I don't like it. And so I don't do it very often. I only do it if it's an event for a really good friend that I want to support. And I do it because I want to support them more than I want to avoid the discomfort of the event, which was the case this weekend. Tyler Perry is a very dear friend of mine, and I would not be there for him for the world. So it way overshadowed my aversion to that kind of event. So I know why I don't do what I don't do. I don't do cocktail parties. I know why. I'm uncomfortable. I'm shy. I don't think I have anything particularly interesting to say. And I'm betting you don't have very much of interest to say. I don't find small talk interesting. I know they don't find it interesting for me. So I just don't go. I would rather stay home in my tennis shorts and socks with Robin and do something around the house. You need to know why you do what you do and don't do what you don't do. What do you spend your time on? I play tennis every day. I know why I do it. Exercise sneaks up on me. I hate jogging. You ever see me running through a neighborhood? Shoot, whoever is 10 feet behind me because they are chasing me. I'm not jogging. I'm being pursued. So please, knock off whoever's right behind me. I'm not jogging. I hate it. But I'll run three miles on the tennis court, no problem, because we're keeping score. There's a ball involved. There's something to chase. I'm keeping score. So it sneaks up on me. It's my social life. It's my exercise. It's my competition. I'm a jock at heart. So it meets several needs. I know why I do it. It's also important for my health. And so I've done it for years and years and years. So I know why I do that. Just like I know why I don't do cocktail parties. I know why I work. I don't need to work. But there are all different kinds of currency. And I take a lot of pride in delivering common sense information to people's homes every day for free. 48% of rural communities in America have no mental health professional available to them at all. Zero, zip, nada, nothing but they can watch and get information that's commonsensical and applicable to their lives. I think it serves a purpose. I think, in my opinion, it's the highest and best use of television. I don't think it's the only use of television. I watch sitcoms sometimes that somebody might look at it and say, well, that's just mindless programming. Well, you know what? That mindless programming is very important to me. Because sometimes I want to just relax and just laugh. That's a great decompression for me. I, I enjoy that. So even though I think what I do is the highest and best use of television, I think everything serves a purpose. So I work for a currency that's not monetary. Well, some of it's monetary, but I mean, it's not number one. The currency is that I'm doing something meaningful that I'm proud of. I'm talking about things that matter to people who care, and I know that. So that's what motivates me, and I like being number one. I like that. We strive really hard. I know why I do what I do. I don't kid myself about it, and I know why I don't do what I don't do. You need to know that about yourself. Everything has a payoff. It's easier to see your payoff when you're figuring out why you do what you do than it is to figure out why you don't do what you don't do. But it's still possible. All you have to do is say, what is my payoff for avoiding a situation? What is my payoff for withdrawing from or sitting on the sidelines in a situation? Because anything you do repeatedly, anything you do in pattern has a payoff. In my situation where I say I tend to not go to cocktail parties, it's easy for me to figure it out because I ask myself the hard question, okay, what are you avoiding? 
What are you afraid is going to happen? What is it that makes you uncomfortable? Why do you not go to parties? What is my payoff for not doing it? For me, the payoff is I avoid the discomfort of having to be in a social situation that is not rewarding for me. I avoid the social awkwardness of standing around with a bunch of people I don't know particularly well or wouldn't flag their cars down to hang out with them. I mean, I just I avoid that situation, and that's my payoff. So if there's something you don't do, like you don't practice a certain skill or you don't do your weekly reports at work or you don't go to therapy with your partner or whatever, what's your payoff for not going? What are you avoiding? And what you're avoiding is your motivation for not going. That's your payoff. You avoid the pain of what would be brought on if you did it. But now let's talk about other people. You need to know why other people do what they do. And if you know, then you can motivate them by giving them the currency they need in order to be motivated to do what you want them to do. Let me give you some clues. People's favorite topic is themselves. People's favorite topic is themselves. Now, you may think, oh, I got a buddy, his favorite topic is football. No, no, it's not. His favorite topic is himself. He wants to talk about what he thinks about football. He wants to talk about what he thinks the Giants are going to do or the Cowboys are going to do or the 49ers are going to do. His favorite topic is him or herself. Now, here's a scary reality. I've talked to you about this a little bit before. We believe people who like us. Think about what I just said. We believe people who like us. We believe people because we feel liked by them. So if somebody is a good audience and we feel like they really like us, you got somebody, you say, they really like me. They are interested in what I have to say. They laugh at my jokes. They pay attention to what I say. They seem to be focused when I'm around. I really feel liked by them. The truth is, unconsciously, you tend to believe that person more than somebody who doesn't like you or who is neutral on you. They're a good audience. And if they know that... They're playing to your ego. Now, they may really like you. There's no question about that. But if that's true, they're going to enjoy validity. They're going to enjoy being believed by you. Let's translate that into behavior for you. If you want to be persuasive with someone, be a good audience. If you want to be persuasive with someone... Make sure they feel liked by you, accepted by you, validated by you. Because if they do, they're going to feel comfortable with you. And when they feel comfortable with you, they are more prone to believe what you say. So if you say, this is a really good car, this would be a good choice for you, and they feel liked by you, they're going to be more likely to believe you when you say, This is a good car for you. So if you're a car salesman and you can make that customer feel liked by you, you're going to have a lot better sales record than you would otherwise. What's the theme song from the old sitcom Cheers? You like to go where everybody knows your name, right? People like to be accepted. They like to feel like they belong. And if you can make people feel accepted, make them feel liked by you, you're going to be a lot more persuasive. Now, you're probably thinking, oh, Doc, you're being really manipulative now. I'm not telling you how the world should work. I'm telling you how the world does work. 
This is Human Dynamics 101. This is Psych 101. If you want to know why somebody with a good personality, a gift, a gab, a ready smile, this the tendency to engage people, just seems to do well in life, I just told you. I'm not saying it's the way it should be. I'm just telling you the way it is. Now, if you can say, well, okay, that's fine, Doc. I just don't want to play that game. Okay, that's okay. But if you want to win, you're going to play the game by the rules that exist. You're going to understand human nature. That's just the way it works. I'm telling you this so you can use it, not abuse it. Now, baiters, they groom people so they can con them. They will use this information that I'm talking about so they can groom somebody to sell them phony stock or seduce somebody's wife or get somebody to lie for them or whatever. They do it for illicit reasons. It's not the reality that is evil. It's the use of it that makes it evil or not. If you use this information to get somebody to buy a car, it only becomes a problem if it's not really a good car. If you're getting them to buy something that you know they can't afford, you know it's a lemon, and you're just trying to unload it on some poor schmuck. And so you use these characteristics, these traits, these behaviors to get this poor sucker to buy this dog with fleas. Okay, now you're a baiter. You've abused your knowledge of human nature. But if you use that to be effective at doing good things, then I don't see that as evil. But again, I'm not telling you how the world should work. I'm just telling you how it does work. Okay, we've come to the end of a long journey with number 16. And... I won't say that I've saved the best for last, but I will say that I have saved the item for last that, if you mismanage it, can have the most devastating effect on your life. You must pick your battles and never let your opponent have control. You must pick your battles and never let your opponent have control. Let me talk about what I mean by pick your battles. Don't ever get in a fight that you don't need to fight. There are a lot of people (laughs) that just, they just can't pass up a good fight. They just don't realize or recognize they don't have to react just because they can. There might be something going on at school with the teachers or the PTA. There are 500 students in the school, which means there are probably 750 parents. You don't have to be the one that fights that battle. Don't ever fight a battle that you don't have to fight. You can think, okay, Dr. Phil, what you're saying is be a passive bystander. What if everybody takes this attitude? Well. If you look around and nobody is stepping up, then that's a battle you need to fight. But you don't need to be the one that charges every machine gun nest first every time. You don't need to be the one that puts yourself at risk every single time. Don't fight a battle you don't need to fight. Fight your fair share, contribute, support, but you don't need to be the first one through the door Every single time, there's going to be a conflict. Don't ever fight a battle that you don't know you can win. Now, again, you're probably saying, oh, wait a minute. What are you saying here? I'm saying if you can't win the battle, don't fight it. Why fight a battle that you cannot win? Again, I'm not telling you how the world should work. I'm telling you how the world does work. Why fight a battle you can't win? If you know that you cannot win this debate, this argument with your boss, then why do it? Go at it another way. Find another approach. Co-opt him or her into your way of thinking, but don't 
choose to engage in a battle that you cannot win. Let's talk about those battles that you do fight. If there's going to be a confrontation, there's going to be a showdown, there's going to be an argument, there's going to be something that is going to come to a resolution with a winner and a loser, you set the terms, you choose the battlefield, you pick the turf. Now, let me tell you how that works in the real world. That means if you've got a conflict with a spouse, a kid, a coworker, somebody at the school, whatever, they don't get to choose when that showdown is going to be. You choose when the showdown is going to be. They may come out to the carpool line and say, uh, yeah, lady, we need to talk. Yeah, okay, we'll talk when you're ready to talk. You don't talk when you've got five minutes to get to work, you're feeling that pressure, you're sitting in your car, she's all dressed to the nines, you're there in some sweats with your hair sticking up, you don't feel ready, you haven't thought about this, you haven't gathered your thoughts, put down your bullet points, you're not ready. Then that's not when you engage. She's setting the terms and the turf. You don't agree with that. You have to say, yeah, that's fine. I'll get in touch when we can work out a schedule. You don't let them dictate the terms, and I'll guarantee you 90% of the time people let their opponent dictate the terms. Don't do that. Say, okay, that's fine. Not here, not now. Well, when and where then? I'll let you know. Don't give them control. Well, you call me by noon. Yeah, I'll call you when I call you. I'll be in touch. You set the terms, you set the place, you set the time. You may not want to communicate all of that. If you have something that's really important to you and you want to get a concession from someone, then you may want to get really prepared and surprise them. You may want to get all your ducks in a row, all your facts together, all your information organized, get everything ready, put it all down on a piece of paper, a notepad. You might want to go over it in front of the mirror five times. You might want to record yourself on your voice memo on your phone, listen to it back. You might want to go through 10 times and then just walk into their office. Knock, 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 knock. I need to talk to you about something really important. Have you got a minute? You've set the time, you've set the terms, you've set the turf, you're ready, they're not. What's really important is that you go in knowing what is a win. What is it you want? Don't go in there just to vent. Are you looking for an apology? Compensation change? Are you looking for some reassignment? Are you looking for some kind of acknowledgement from your child or your spouse? What? Decide what is a win. I think you should avoid confrontation at every turn. Avoid battles at every turn. But when you do, you need to play to win. And you need to know exactly what is a win. You want to give them a face-saving way out. But when I say win, it has to be a win. It's not like being sort of pregnant. You either win or you don't. If it is a confrontation, if it is adversarial, you don't sort of win. You don't sort of get a concession you need to crush them. And again, you're probably thinking, damn, that didn't seem very fair. It's not fair. You're in a fight. I've said avoid it every way you possibly can. Try to negotiate. Try to come up with some kind of cooperative solution. Try to come up with anything you can besides a battle. 
But if you get into a battle and there is no way to avoid it, then you need to play to win and you need a decisive victory. As I said, out prepare the other side. What are their hot buttons? What is it you know you can talk about that will distract them, that will get them to be less efficient? You know, in the war, Tokyo Rose was something that was used to really distract the American troops. The Japanese had this radio station that played for the American troops to listen to. They played music that the American troops wanted to hear. But then the DJ, the commentary was Tokyo Rose, and she was putting out propaganda. Do you know that your country hates you? Do you know that they don't want to be in this war? Do they know that this is all over and that you're losing and that you're not supported back home, etc.? trying to push their hot buttons to demoralize them. Well, what are the hot buttons of the person you're in the battle with? What are they sensitive to? What can I distract them with? But understand, know what constitutes a win and don't stop until you have it. Let me go back over this in quick summary. Pick your battles. Don't fight one that you can avoid. Don't fight a battle you can't win. Make sure you set the terms, you set the time, you set the turf. Out, prepare the other side. Be absolutely certain you know what it is that constitutes a win for you. And when I say avoid it, try to work something out. Try to compromise. Do anything you can. I'm just talking about when you get drawn into a battle, whether you want it or not. Like I said, I would never go into a nice restaurant be standing in the lobby and get in a fist fight. But if I walk into a nice restaurant and I'm standing in the lobby and somebody takes a swing at me, guess what? I'm in a fist fight. Didn't want it, didn't choose it, do anything to avoid it. But if somebody starts windmilling at me, I'm in a fist fight and I am going to protect myself and my family. And I am not going to stop until I know he is 100% subdued. Not sort of, but 100% subdued. I didn't want it, didn't choose it. But once I'm in it, I know what a win is. And that is to eliminate the threat to my family. Neutralize the threat. So do everything you can to avoid these. But make no mistake, when you get in them, play to win. Some of these things... I know you're going to be thinking, boy, Doc, you sound pretty cutthroat. Like I said, I'm not telling you how it should be. I'm telling you how it is. So take what you can use. Reject what you don't want. But that's not going to change the way the world works. We're going to talk about how to use this in your life in some different ways in some upcoming podcast. I hope this has helped. I'm Dr. Phil.